Hey, welcome back. We are in a very powerful book. This is 2 Peter. Uh, just finished 1 Peter. If you haven't had a chance to look at that, it's only about 15 minutes. Uh, go take a look at that. But 2 Peter is full of a lot of things, especially things that uh, deal with the second coming of Christ, the uh, persecutions that we are facing in today's world. Uh, I believe you're going to get a lot out of it. Thank you for watching. Let's jump right in and see what he says. This book was written by Peter. It's a few years after his first letter, but now he's in a Roman prison, and this is around 67 AD. This is about the time that uh, most theologians feel that he uh, was crucified. He refers to his first letter in chapter 3. Now, the issues of acceptance into the Bible's canon had to do with a different quality in the style of Greek from the writing of 1 Peter, but this can be answered by a different scribe or Peter himself writing it. Peter was not a, a good Greek writer or speaker necessarily. He had helps of, of Mark and Silas. And uh, at this point, it looks like he's writing it himself. So the style changed some, uh, kind of like going from a 12th grader, uh, maybe to a third or fourth grader trying to write it out. At any rate, uh, but the topics discussed match his personality and his personal testimony very closely, uh, such as the transfiguration mentioned in 1 and 16. So on that note, this letter warns us about false teachers infiltrating the church, so we needed to be careful. And there were many uh, letters in the early days that people were saying, hey, we've got a letter from Paul or a letter from Peter, and they were trying to encourage people to come over uh, to their church and hear the letter or whatever. But he said, he's warning us, stay away from these false teachers, these false teachings. But this letter is, uh, is very definitely from Peter himself. This is like his last will and testament because he will soon die. It's mentioned in 12, 15. We're going to read that. And he references Paul in the last part of his writing, uh, which is a good testimony that Paul's teachings are good. He talks about them being difficult writings. Uh, especially when you consider that it's a very big change from the old ways of the Old Testament to the sacrificing in the temple with the priest. And now we look to Christ as our sacrifice. The blood he spilt on the cross covers our sins. So it is a difficult way, but the true way. So let's jump right. Wow, there's a, a lot of stuff. I tried to split this screen up, but there was just no way because it all just kind of worked together. So let's just kind of pick it apart. I've only got six or seven slides, so we won't try to take too long today. He says, so I will always remind you. And I love that uh, concept. We, we don't need to be thinking that I, I read the Bible one time. I need to move on or I go to church on Sunday. This is something we need to go through seven days a week. Uh, this comes straight out of Deuteronomy 6, where he talks about in the morning, in the evening, when we're coming, when we're going with your kids, when you sit down at the table all the time, reminding us of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth that you now have, doesn't matter. Satan comes like a roaring lion, we learn in the first Peter, and he will try to steal what knowledge we do have or, or dampen our the wick, the, the burning inside of us. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. As long as he's here, he's going to continue telling the stories of Christ and reminding us the, the events that happen. Because I know that I will soon put it aside. This is where he says, I'm fixing to die. I'm not going to be here much longer. As our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, Jesus told him, someone is going to lead you in a way that you don't necessarily want to go. And that would be that would be death. And I will make every effort to see that my departure, uh, that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So that is his main emphasis, his main hope that we don't forget what he taught us. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. No, Jesus told him, and he's telling us. Jesus is coming back. The way he left, they were told this is the way he's going to come back. That's Peter's uh, message. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I love that. I saw it myself, Peter saying. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory from heaven saying, This is my son whom I love. 
With him I am well pleased. You see, Peter said, I heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain, the, the Mount of Transfiguration. And he said, I heard this thing. I heard the voice from heaven come down, speaking of Christ. I saw that glorious presentation of Moses and Elijah there beside him, speaking to him just prior to his going to the cross. And this is Peter's testimony. He said, I saw it. I know what I saw. I'm an eyewitness to this. Believe me. We also have the, the prophetic message, the scriptures, all of the scriptures. Those are the prophecies. Um, as if it's something completely reliable. They are reliable messages. The things that, that were said it was going to happen, they did happen. They are reliable. Hundreds of messages, hundreds of prophecies. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to your, uh, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns, until the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, that morning star we believe to be uh, Jesus at this point. Uh, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophets on interpretation of things. And that, that's very true. Prophecy cannot know the future unless it's inspired by God. For the prophecy had the origin, uh, uh, prophecy never had origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. All of this to say that you need to look at the prophecy in the Old Testament and you need to remember our testimony as well. These things are true in regard to Christ. So that's why he continues to remind us to refresh our memory. And because the, these these things, we, we need to remember them. These are not cleverly devised stories. These are truthful events. These things really happen. Hallelujah. Now, there are false prophets among the people just as there will be false teachers. Uh, and that, that definitely happened in his day. There were people coming and telling stories that were not true, uh, testifying to, uh, to knowing something that they didn't know. There's going to be a lot of false teachings in today's world as well. We can dig it out ourselves. There's an, there's an ability to find the truth. And if you seek him, you will find him. My urge to you, my, my concern for your soul, for your heart, uh, for all believers, is that we dig out the truth. The Bible can handle the ridicule. It can handle you seeking out to know uh, what is the truth. There's a lot of people that are, uh, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube or TikTok or uh, Instagram, whatever, telling you that, that the Bible's not true and that these are false teachings or false writings. Uh, they're not. They're, they're real, and they can handle you getting in there and trying to find the truth. Dig it out. If God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but he sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood down on ungodly people, but he protect, protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, his family. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by the burning of them to ashes, and he made them an example of what he's going to do to the ungodly, and he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the depraved conduct of this lawlessness and living among them in Sodom there day after day. He was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and he heard. So if this is so, if, if he's punished others in the past, but delivered others in the past, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. The point is, is those things were made for our example. I, I, I think back a lot of times to the people of Noah's day. They didn't have a Bible, but within their heart, they knew what was right and what was wrong. It's not right to go murder. It's not right to go steal. It's not right to take someone else's wife. It's the right thing to do to listen to God, listen to the stories, to know what is right. There is a morality that all mankind knows that there's some, this came from somewhere. Where does it come from? Well, if we reject God, uh, we go down a, a dark path. But if we will heed to God and look to God, help me to understand God will show us the truth through his spirit. We invite the spirit to live inside of us and he will help us to understand what is good and what is evil. 
2 Peter 3 goes in, understand that in the last days there will be scoffers that will come. People will not agree with us. They will not believe what we're saying, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming that you promised? Where's this coming? He said he's coming back. Where is he? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has been from the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being. And the earth was formed out of water, and by water, and by these waters also the word of that time was deluged and destroyed. So out of his same word came creation. Out of his same word came destruction. God, in his power, has the authority and the ability to, to change the circumstances. So this scoffing, this laughing at him coming, he is coming. And when we look out into the heavens and we see the creation as it is, we need to recognize that if you see creation and you know he made it, he's also going to destroy the people that are evil, just like he did in the flood days. By the same word, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. So this is a different type of destruction that Peter has been told by Christ that as the early days the earth was destroyed by water, in the latter days the earth is going to be destroyed by fire. It's coming. Everything that we try to do to preserve this earth, it's a falsehood. We're never going to be able to save everything because this is the kind of destruction coming. I'm not saying that we need to just blow off uh, saving the earth or trying to do the right thing with our earth. He's told us to take care of it and to, to watch over the earth. But at the same time, we know that this destruction is coming. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow to keep in his promise, as some understand slowness. Regarding this, listen, there's been about 6,000 years since the earth has been created. If we look at the genealogy, if we understand the word in the first day, in the second day, and then finally the seventh day, there was a rest of that day. If we look at this, this comment of Peter, and we can understand it as a type of prophecy, and there's other ways to determine this within the scripture. If you look at the six days of creation and the seventh day rest, and now we look at the 6,000 years that we've been here, we know that we're in the last days where that seventh day or the thousand year rest is coming. Christ is coming in his millennial reign to watch over us. And you can look that up in the scripture yourself. We, we, we know that this is the day of the fig tree, that when the days are green, when the tree leaves are young, that in that generation that the Son of Man is coming. When, when Israel was established in 1947, it's been about 73, 74 years at this point. So we're in a generation of seeing the Lord coming back. Uh, I've been told that uh, the, the, the heavens are preparing the horses to come and get us. The horses are being bridled and the, uh, the, the wedding rehearsal is, is done. And it is time for the marriage supper of the bride and the groom to come together. And when those gates are closed, they're closed. You want to join this marriage supper with the Lord. Be ready. Be ready. And to be ready, let me just stop right here and say... All you got to do is confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. So confess, confess that Jesus, I believe what you told Peter and what you told the other apostles, what you inspired Paul to write, how you proved the prophecy of the Old Testament in your word. And indeed, you are the Messiah. He is and he's coming back for those that believe in him. Look around, people. Look around. You can see what's going on. All right. But he is patient with us, not wanting that anybody perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. You know, if we knew when the thief was coming, we'd have been prepared for him. But we need to be prepared anyway. Uh, a lot of people are prepared for thieves in this day with their, their guns and their ammo and their weapons and watching with cameras. And they, they lock their doors with several locks. But we don't know when a thief is actually coming. And Christ is the same. We don't know the exact hour. But the Father does. And when the Father says, go, the Son will come and he will take his bride. The heavens will disappear with the roar. And the elements will be destroyed by fire. 
and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Some tough words, tough words for many that will be judged. If you believe in Christ, you don't have anything to worry about. There may be some pain for a little while. Peter's here in prison. He's going to go through a pain for a moment, but not after this. Now, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? What kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives in fear as you look forward to the day of God with its speed and its coming. And that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. I would say that it's going to be a resurrected earth. You know, God created this earth in the beginning and it was good. No, it was very good. So why would he just get rid of his earth rather than to restore it or resurrect the earth? And the new earth where righteousness will dwell, where he will reign over the earth. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless. The only way to be found spotless is not by you being perfect or not by you following all of the law, not by you doing everything perfectly uh, because we can't. But you, you are found spotless by the blood of Christ on you. Those people in Israel were not spotless when, uh, the, excuse me, in Egypt, when Israel put blood over their house on the inside, they were simply being faithful to what Moses had told them to do. Put the blood over your house and death will pass you by. Same thing with us. Put the blood of Christ over our house through faith and death will pass us by. All right, blameless and at peace with him. Our dear brother Paul also wrote you with wisdom that God gave him. So God inspired Paul, and, and this is Peter recognizing that. He writes in the same way with all of his letters, speaking in them on these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people, they distort it and they twist it, and they say these are not true. How can you wipe out the law? It's not exactly what Paul was saying, but you need to read them and dig out the truths of that. But uh, Peter is saying that's what they're doing. They're distorting it as they do with other scriptures to their own destruction. So Paul is doing the right thing. Paul is, is, is spoken of highly by Peter in this, in this verse. So therefore, as he's wrapping his uh, second letter up, he says, Dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away with the error of lawless and fall from your secure position. That is our secure position in Christ. But grow, grow. Keep digging out the truth, learning the scripture. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Listen, thank you for watching. That's going to be all of Second Peter. God bless you all. Hope you'll come back and watch some more of these uh, great studies that we get a chance to do. God bless.